Hi there. My name is Aaron Landerman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and in a previous lecture in guitar amplification and effects, I presented a small signal model for triodes. For the rest of this course, after today's lecture, I'm pretty much going to try to avoid using that small signal model directly, and instead I'm going to use Thevenin equivalent circuits looking into either the plate or the cathode of the triode that are presented in terms of a Thevenin equivalent of the circuitry on the other side of the tube. I learned about this particular technique in the context of solid state electronics from my colleague Marshall Leach, who was an amazing researcher and an amazing teacher and an overall amazing human being. He was very generous with his time with both his students and professors. Marshall taught ECE 3050, our analog electronics class, which is now known as ECE 3400, for many, many years using these techniques involving Thevenin's theorem. And to my knowledge, he's the only person to teach this material using these kind of techniques except for me when I taught it in the spring 2018 semester. And what I'm going to do here is basically take these techniques and try to apply them to tubes instead of transistors. This is probably the most conceptually intricate lecture of the entire class. It might be worth watching it a couple of times, and a lot of what I talk about here won't really click until you see it used in application. And although it will be difficult to wrap your head around some of it, the time you spend here will pay dividends later. I'll be using these techniques constantly over the next month. All right, that's enough waffling. On the left here, I've drawn a generic single triode amplifier circuit. I'm using VGG and VKK here because I want to be fairly generic about what these voltage sources are. If I were to zero out VKK and input a signal to the grid through VGG, well, if I look at my output here at the plate, that's my common cathode configuration. Whereas if I take my output from the cathode, then that would be my common drain, aka cathode follower configuration. Now, as far as common grid goes, well, if I were to zero out VGG and also zero out RK, then VKK would be my input to a common grid amplifier. The resistor used for biasing for a common grid configuration would actually be down here and be irrelevant as far as the small signal circuit goes. All right, if I were to take that triode and replace it with the details of the series small signal model where we have a dynamic resistance RP and a voltage-controlled voltage source here, and remember, I'm using this upside down T here to represent ground. So this is the voltage at the cathode relative to ground. What I'm going to do is I'm going to abstract this a little bit further, combine this RL and RP into something I'm going to call R top and replace this RK with what I'm calling R bottom here, the resistance at the bottom of the circuit in contrast with the resistance at the top. So we can call that R bot. And I'm changing this from an uppercase to a lowercase letter because I want to imagine that what's happening over on this side could actually be something much more complicated, a much more complex network that we've replaced with a Thevenin equivalent circuit looking out. So we've replaced potentially a bunch of complicated stuff with a Thevenin voltage in series with a Thevenin resistance. Similarly, this might be more complicated than just one resistance RL. This could involve a whole bunch of complicated stuff that we've simplified to the single resistance. Now, every time I've taught this, I've gone back and forth as to whether to always leave RP out of this R top and add it in separately or include it as part of R top. The thing is that no matter what is happening out here, RP is part of that triode model. It's inseparable. But I think writing it like this reveals a certain kind of interesting symmetry that's harder to see if you're constantly breaking out RP as a separate element. I don't know. Your mileage may vary. You could do this either way. So the game I'm going to play is I'm going to create Thevenin equivalent circuits for looking down into this negative terminal in terms of the Thevenin equivalent circuit of what's happening out here on the cathode side. And then you can always add RP back in. And similarly, I'm going to develop a Thevenin equivalent circuit looking up into the positive side of the voltage-controlled voltage source 
in terms of what's happening with this resistance up here. I should also mention that all of these resistances could be replaced with impedances and everything will still make sense. So you can change R's to Z's if you really want to get into what the capacitors are doing. So first, let's find out what the Thevenin voltage is looking down into the negative side of the voltage-controlled voltage source. If I were to zero out VGG and RBOT and implement my input through VKK, this would correspond to a common grid configuration. Whereas if I were to zero out VKK and implement my input through VGG, this would correspond to a common cathode configuration. Remember, a Thevenin equivalent voltage is an open circuit voltage. So the Thevenin equivalent voltage looking down into the circuit is something we compute assuming that there's no current flowing through the circuit. If there's no current flowing through the circuit, it means there's no voltage lost across this resistor. So the only contributions to V down are this voltage source and this voltage source. So VGK is just VGG minus VKK, and so I'll multiply that by mu to get my voltage here. And we can do this because VK with this little ground symbol, that's just VKK because there's no voltage difference between these two points because there's no voltage drop across here. So V down consists of two terms. One is VKK and the other is this mu VGK. But remember that there's a minus sign up here, so we'll wind up with a minus sign here. So rearranging that expression a little bit, and grouping the VKK terms together, I see that we have VKK times mu plus one, so that's a non-inverting configuration, and then we have VGG times mu, but with a minus sign, so that's an inverting configuration. But notice that both of these are providing a good chunk of gain, with the non-inverting configuration through the cathode providing a minuscule amount of additional gain. Instead of going on and computing the Thevenin resistance looking down into the voltage-controlled voltage source, I would like to handle all of the Thevenin voltages at once. So let's talk about the Thevenin voltage seen looking up into the positive terminal of the voltage-controlled voltage source. So that Thevenin voltage seen looking up into the VCVS is going to match the voltage at the cathode relative to ground. And again, remember, if you're computing Thevenin voltages, you're computing an open circuit voltage. So there's no current flowing through here. And so there's no voltage drop across to our top. So the only voltage we have contributing to our Thevenin voltage here is this voltage-controlled voltage source. So substituting in what VGK is, I'll have VGG minus V up. So I have V up on both sides because V up is my voltage at the cathode times mu. So now I can just solve this equation. Let me move mu minus V up over to the left-hand side. And if I factor out V up, I wind up with a mu plus one factor. And if I divide that out, I wind up with my Thevenin voltage being my VGG times mu over mu plus one. So this is that common drain, AKA cathode follower configuration. It cannot give you gain. It can, however, if mu is reasonably big, give you a gain that's pretty close to one, but it's not gonna go over one. So that was all about Thevenin voltages. How about let's compute some Thevenin resistances. So we're going to compute the Thevenin resistance looking down into the negative terminal of the controlled source. Standard operating procedure in computing a Thevenin resistance is to zero out the various independent sources. So to make this meaningful, usually you need to introduce an external voltage source or current source. Here I'm going to imagine that we're introducing a test current source and then we need to compute the associated test voltage that occurs if we were to introduce such a source. I find this to be a somewhat awkward and artificial description of the underlying wonderful magical truth about Thevenin equivalence, but it's a useful procedure. So the grid to cathode voltage here is just zero minus the cathode to ground voltage. So we take that and multiply it by mu. So then our test voltage is going to be the cathode to ground voltage minus 
the voltage across this controlled source because there's a minus sign here, but that voltage itself has a minus sign, so those cancel giving us this plus sign here. And I can simplify that to mu plus one times that cathode voltage. And well, what's the cathode voltage? Well, by Ohm's law, that's just this resistance times the test current. So I can plug that in. So I can compute the Thevenin resistance as the test voltage that is induced by our test current. So that's just mu plus one times our Arbot resistance because the I tests wind up canceling out. So that's pretty nice. All right, so now let's compute the Thevenin resistance looking up into the positive terminal of the controlled source. So now we can place our test current source going into the positive terminal, and then the test voltage is just the cathode to ground voltage. So our grid to cathode voltage is just zero minus that test voltage, and we can take that and multiply it by mu. And now if we can figure out what the voltage at this terminal is, we can use Ohm's law to figure out the test current. So here I'm going to say that the voltage here is going to be the test voltage minus this voltage here, but that has a minus, so again, those minus signs cancel. So I wind up with mu plus one times V test. This basically parallels the structure we had in the earlier case of looking down into the negative terminal. So the test current is mu plus one times the test voltage divided by R top. And so we can now compute our Thevenin resistance as the test voltage over the test current. Notice the test current is in the denominator. So the mu plus one over R top flips upside down and I wind up with R top over mu plus one. And then the V test wind up canceling when I substitute the I test into the denominator here. So here we have R top divided by mu plus one. Notice the interesting symmetry here. If we're looking down into the negative terminal, we see this resistance on the other side multiplied by mu plus one. Whereas if we're looking up into the positive terminal, we're seeing this resistance divided by mu plus one. So that's really interesting. And this here explains why the common grid amplifier configuration has such mediocre input impedance, because whatever resistance you see up here, well, that winds up getting shrunk by dividing by mu plus one. And for an input impedance, if we're transferring information with voltages, we want that input impedance to be high. But this also explains why the cathode follower, the common drain configuration, is such a good voltage buffer, because for a voltage output, you want the output impedance to be low. So here's the main unifying slide. So for looking down into the negative terminal, and this is what we're going to use to analyze the common cathode and common grid configurations, we can replace this circuit with this Thevenin equivalent, where the resistance over here gets multiplied by mu plus one, and the voltages at the terminal are manifest with a good amount of gain. There's inverting gain associated with the signal coming into the grid, and there's non-inverting gain associated with the signal coming in through the cathode. Now the configuration we would use to analyze the common drain amplifier, where we're looking up into the positive terminal, there we have a Thevenin equivalent where we divide the resistance we see on the other side by mu plus one. So there's this weird symmetry going on. But we don't wind up with a lot of gain from the signal coming through the grid. In fact, we get a gain that's less than one. But if mu is big as it is for practical tubes, you'll get a gain close to one. We'll be making use of these Thevenin equivalents extensively over the next month. To my knowledge, these Thevenin equivalents and the way I'm going to use them are unique to me. You won't find them in any textbook. You'll find them right here. Although it's not required for this class, I highly recommend that you check out Professor Leach's website. It's an absolute goldmine of information. If you click on ECE 3050 here, you'll find his analog electronics class website. And you can find the BJT formula sheet 
This gives the various Thevenet equivalents that he computed for the BJT that he uses throughout the class. And you can also look at his MOSFET and JFET formula sheet, which is obviously the sets of Thevenet equivalents he created for field effect transistors. Once he sets up those equivalents, it lets him conduct the rest of the course without ever actually solving any systems of equations. He can often derive the input and output impedances of various circuits and their gain almost by inspection and just a little bit of algebra. And that's the goal here. I don't like having to solve systems of equations. You don't like having to solve systems of equations. These Thevenin equivalents will help us avoid solving systems of equations. And more usefully, I think, these Thevenin equivalents will give us insights into the behavior of these circuits that you won't get by just brute force writing down KCL equations and solving them.